Uh, this is just a simple um, naive point on, on uh, both your first and last point. So I wonder on, on your three there, you say, if we do not perceive a necessary connection, then it may seem questionable. But I wonder even if we do perceive a necessary connection, it may be questionable. Um, so if you take the first step of Malabranta's argument, mm -hmm. uh, it's a weird first step. Uh, a true cause is a cause between which and its effect the mind perceives a necessary connection. So you know, when, when I think of that, I ask myself, whose mind? So I mean, if you think we define in terms of my mind or the human mind, uh, well, why would that be a good general? But you know, so you could believe that there are tons of necessary connections out there, and they all have to be such that some mind can perceive a necessary connection in there. But it might be that for the most part, it's God's mind that can perceive these necessary connections. But you could also believe we happen to have this funny facility to see some necessary connection, like the one between God and its effects in some general way or whatever. But the other ones we don't see, and so we shouldn't get into occasionalism or something. We should just say that uh, uh, you know like we have a little epistemic problem with necessary connections, but necessary connections and causality go together. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, one might indeed uh, wonder that. Uh, I mean, uh, and I'm sure that if you ask Malbranche, uh, Malbranche, he would say, yeah, God sees a necessary connection between divine volition and, uh, and divine volitions and their effects. Um, I'm pretty sure that he means uh, by the mind, he, he means in this context our mind. I mean, the structure of, of the argument suggests that. Also, uh, the fact that uh, scattered through his, his early work, uh, there are various uh, passages in which he's saying, well, you know, uh, how do we form causal ideas? Well, we form them by noting regularities. I mean, Hume wasn't the first to, uh, by many centuries, Hume was not the first to uh, uh, take that observation. Um, and uh, the, uh, so th there's clearly the, uh, the point being made that uh, we can't, we, sh we shouldn't, uh, argue post hoc ergo propter hoc, I mean, uh, uh, that. And that line of argument is an old one. I mean, it can be traced back to the medieval Islamic theologians who've been called occasionalists. So there's some, I think, uh, yes, Malbranche is uh, standing in that tradition. Now, uh, indeed, there is the question um, whether he should ever have thought that this was a good argument. Uh, and I'm actually inclined to think not. Uh, but again, um, what we think about that uh, uh, is likely to depend on whether, uh, is likely to be influenced whether, by whether we think that Malbranche in the end was wise rather than unphilosophical not to offer a reductive account of causality as Hume did. Because the underlying point I take it is uh, that uh, we have to ask uh, what kind of necessity is involved in the necessary connection. And at first, I, I mean, in the first line of argument that Malbranche uses, it's very tempting to think that he supposed, well, it was a conceptual necessity. But uh, when he sees in 1683 that he does perceive a conceptual necessity uh, by which uh, the, uh, the occurring of what God wills follows from God's omnipotence, uh, he still says he doesn't see the kind of necessity that he's looking for there. And so uh, he realizes at that point that he supposes that there's a causal necessity that is something other than conceptual necessity. Uh, and uh, uh, he doesn't look at all disposed to follow Hume's line of saying, well, why suppose anything like that? What other sort of necessity might there be? I, th I think Malbranche has a response to the two objections that you raise under Roman numeral two, section C, 
subheading to <laughs> A and B. <laughs> so uh, first to uh, 2C, 2A, um, Malbranche later moved away from the view that there is a real power in creatures to move this tendency towards things. So his earlier view was sort of a fire hose view of the will. You've got this th you know, shooting water, and you can efficaciously direct it here or there. He later realized that that, that was inconsistent with the occasionals and a move to the view where, in fact, rather than having a real power in, in the mind to move this force from God, rather the will simply um, suspends its consent. And so he thinks he can claim that it's not a real power since it doesn't produce anything real, but simply refrains. Yes. Uh, uh, I agree that that's the, the, the case. I, I have some thoughts about uh, how he moves there, but uh, I want to hear, why don't you go on to the uh, Okay, then, and the second case, response. it's sort of related. Um, you say, is that true of God if God does not cause the sins of creatures? Um, but if the sins, so God is the one who does everything and all things, but if sins are not real things, they don't need a cause. Well, that's, uh, uh, I mean, that's actually, I mean, Malbranche actually starts taking that line already uh, uh, in the first elucidation to the search before he has, uh, changed his general line of argument. It obviously becomes even more important once he's uh, 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 taken to giving priority to uh, arguments from uh, his views about uh, uh, God's con conserving activity being continuous creation. Um, I think the... Um, it, uh, I mean, I do have a footnote uh, about that at the end. It was I was I was originally going to say uh, t talk about it, but uh, I knew I didn't have uh, wasn't going to have time. I had even less time <laughs> uh, than that. But I mean, basically, I mean, it is a case that he is. I mean, in that way of trying to deal with it. First of all, he is supposing that uh, causation, uh, real causation, has to be production of being. That's not something he has said explicitly in his most general statement, I, I think. Certainly not in the, uh, in the first version of the occasionalist uh, theory. Um, and uh, and one can ask why that view shouldn't ye lead to mere conservationism rather than to occasionalism. Uh, his statements on this point, interestingly, uh, tend to involve a departure from Cartesian ontology, which so far as I recall is unargued, uh, namely, uh, Malbranche, in, when he, he's doing this with free will, uh, treats modalities, in effect, as beings, uh, which sort of sounds if he's treating what he calls modalities, including size and shape of extended things, uh, as real qualities, qual that, which is to say qualities that are things in the Cartesian sense that Descartes rejected, whereas it's clear that for Descartes, Modes are not beings in additional to the being of the substance that, that has them. And the, uh, furthermore, uh, the, at the intuitive level, uh, it seems to me that it, it's so intuitively powerful to say, hey, look, if the question is, is God responsible for the creature sinning or not, it doesn't make any fundamental difference whether the th sinning is a thing or not. Uh, and the, 
we want to know, you know, is God responsible for the creature being like this in this context or not? And uh, if we ask, are thinking, you know, what might we want a causal explanation of? Uh, we would want a causal explanation for the creature resting as well as not. A further problem with the line of argument, by the way, uh, is uh, that the uh, the formal st the, the initial statements, and I don't think he ever gives them up, of uh, freedom of the will require that the creature be able either to rest or not to rest. Now, if one of those, the resting, is a non-being, looks as if the other is being. And of course, you'll say, well, the being of it is caused by God, but the creature determines something there. Uh, that is to say, there's more being in the creature's state, given that the creature decides that way than if the creature decided the other way. So uh, I have to say, you know, I, I, I find I've always found that line of defense uh, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> very unconvincing. Uh, besides which, uh, in the part that I didn't have time to read about the continuous creation stuff, I argue that Malbranche, in effect, that Malbranche was, would have been, if Malbranche thought he needed that to reconcile free will with the continuous creation stuff, he was wrong. Uh, my view is, in fact, there isn't any inconsistency there either if you understand what it is that anyone who's trying, including Malbranche, who's trying to defend the kind of doctrine of free will uh, he's trying to defend has to say uh, continuous creation is, is not relevant to it, in my opinion. There's a question behind me, yep. Um, so I have a question about, I guess, Roman 1, letter E, mm -hmm. uh, where we've got the sort of the two interpretations of these general volitions. And mm -hmm. I guess I wanted to throw a third interpretation out there and see if it might split the difference between the worries that you had about each. So it seemed like the worry about the, um, the uh, bunch of particular volitions that are occasioned by the antecedent of the conditional uh, was that we have too many volitions there and God would be foolish to multiply them that way. And then the worry about the conditional form one was that we ran into the, the sorts of logical problems that you bring up in the next section. Oh. Uh, for, for the connection, sorry, the worry for using it um, in the I way see. that we need for the argument in I section A. Yeah, that's right. Um, and what I was wondering is, what if... Uh, what if we had an interpretation on which God has sort of one volition with scattered effects uh, so that every time, you know, God sort of in one stroke moves a whole bunch of bodies subsequent to a whole bunch of angel willings. Uh, and so it's general in that it's got like seven, you know, 700,000 different effects, but it's still just the one volition doing it. So instead of it being either conditional in form or a bunch of particular volitions with uh, when the antecedent is satisfied, it's a general willing of a whole bunch of motion at once. Okay. Uh, thank you. That, uh, that <coughs> uh, prompts me to explain something that needs to be explained and I didn't take the time to explain it before. Uh, we should be clear, and Malbranch is clear, uh, that like most of the philosophical theologians at the time, uh, he does not suppose that God ever makes more, I mean, as, as regards what goes on in the divine mind, so to speak, he does not suppose that God ever makes more than one decision about everything in the world. Uh, and, you know, that's, uh, there's a, early on in the Leibniz Arno correspondence, uh, uh, Leibniz uh, gets Arno to agree to that. That's common ground between Leibniz and Arno, it's common ground. With Malbranche. How, so when Malbranche talks about God multiplying his volitions, 
the multiplication has to 